I'm up at Eel Clan. My wife's at the Hop Clan. Uh, we're known as the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, Six Nations Confederacy. But we're the Haudenosaunee, people of the Long House. And our, and our house extends throughout the forest. Our house is our home. And at the beginning of our contact with the Europeans, we, we um, reached out to them because they were tired and hungry, sickly and so forth. And we reached out to help them and offer them what we have, the peace that we have, and survival of the forest and so forth. We didn't understand their uh, concepts of thinking and what their motives were. But in our teachings, the great tree of peace was planted and the roots extend in all directions and everybody is welcome to follow those roots, the white roots of peace, to the tree of peace sent down by a messenger from the Creator of unity and strength amongst the people. Procedures, protocols, and so forth are all in the law, what we're known in English as the great law of peace. And so when these foreigners came, we felt that they were following the roots of peace. And so we reached out and helped them. And to this day, still carrying on, or reaching out to help them, although we understand some of their motives now, seeking new home, homeland. And so I brought with me some belts representing who we are as the Haudenosaunee, and also representing our contact with the Europeans when they arrived here. After we showed them and taught them how to live and be thankful of the what's plentiful for all of us in the forest. We've noticed that they weren't going away, so we <laughs> understood that we need to have an agreement and an understanding. They need to understand the natural laws of the forest. And so we shared with them the great law of peace. This was back in 1490s. And with our brothers to the east, our brother nations. We work with them, helping these people to become comfortable after their long journey and now their stay. And as time went on now, we're talking into the 1600s. We're coming up the river, coming closer into our woods. It was the Mohawk people who noticed them again and reached out to them again. It was a different group of Europeans. These ones were the Dutch. And the same thing went on. We reached our hands out to them and offer assistance and guidance and so forth to them how to survive in the forest. And so we shared the peace. And the message was brought to us. And in the belt that was explained of the great laws, our recording efforts, our, our method of documentation. And so I'll share now that one belt that united us as the Haudenosaunee. Some of you may recognize it. It's flying around the world now. It 
came about to travel around the world with this belt was through the game of lacrosse. And we traveled around the world playing in uh, international competition, our young men. We didn't have a flag. All the countries we were playing had flags all across, and the people asked our leadership that we were conducting the travel arrangements and so forth throughout the world. We did a cross team asked, where's your flag? And so the message came back to the young people, the young players, and said, we need to answer this question. And the young people answered it, but we don't, we don't need a flag, we know who we are. <laughs> explained at that time that we do, that's true, and we understand who we are. See the great law of peace and the Hodi Mishoni, but the rest of the world don't know us. And they responded back, they will after the game. <laughs> 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 and so the minds got together and thought, what, what can we use for a flag? And this is our identification amongst ourselves as it is, so we thought we'd share that again with who we are. So we, you look at this as the, as the longhouse. Better translation to English is the laws of nature. The laws of nature are all in, strung into these beads as procedures, protocols, so forth as we survive in the forest. And so we shared this with the Europeans. And we also shared it again with the second European invasion in the 1600s, when trade, the fur trade and all that was going on. Usually to explain this situation with our contact would take quite some time. And we don't have that time today to get into all the details of it, but the details are in the belts. The respect for all that's in here, in our, in our house is recorded in the belts and shared with our people regularly as reminders. It's our oral teachings. We usually start any kind of gathering that we have with what is interpreted in English as the words before all else. It's the Ganohanyo. It's a Thanksgiving address. And it starts off with all the people who are involved at this gathering. And we kindly and respectfully put our minds together as one and give a great gratitude that we're all well enough to be here. And so we'll have it that way in our minds. And then we carry on to our Mother Earth and all that she has provided for us and her duties are still being carried on to what was instructed to her by the Creator. To take care of the people to walk about here on Earth in peace and we kindly and respectfully put our minds together as one and give a great thanksgiving to our Mother of the Earth. And then we go on into the berries and the medicines and the grasses. I'm condensing all of these, but they all have their own place in this, individually spoken for. And as we go along to condense it, just to get shorter for today's session of meetings here, is it goes on into the medicines, in which they all have a leader. It goes on into the foods, with the corn beans and squash, or the three sisters that provide for us. It goes on into the waters, into the winds, into the streams, the rivers, the ponds, the lakes. And that the water is still carrying on its duties, take care of our mother who takes care of us, it works in balance. When we talk about the medicines, there's a procedure and protocols are in here for gathering medicines, and the medicines all know our names. There's people, there are relatives, the forest, the trees, the animals. We're all related. We all survive off of our mother's nourishments. And so when we go to gather medicines, we always give a thanksgiving to the medicines for carrying on the responsibilities that were instructed for them to take care of us. And we acknowledge the medicines to the first one we see. And we ask them to pass on the words of respect and kindness from our hearts and our minds that we need to use their strengths. And it's passed on to tell your relatives this 
we always leave the first one we speak to. It's in the laws that we shared on survival in the forest. If we all carried out, if everyone in this room right now understood that law and lived by that law, we'd always, we'd all know that there's always going to be some for the next generations to come because our decisions that are made today are not to affect us only. They're to not negatively affect future generations, seven generations to come. Any decision we make today is to no way negatively affect them that are yet to be seen here walking on earth. And so that's part of the protocols that are in here. That's part of the protocols that are shared with anybody who follows the white roots of peace to seek shelter under the great love. <coughs> and so this was shared with them. And like I say, there's so much detail in, in the message of the great law of peace, it usually takes eight to ten days to recite it. And I got a short time to, so I'm condensing a lot of it. So when I talk about the Thanksgiving address, it's, it's, it's the fundamentals of survival, is to be thankful, grateful for what is all here. And so as we carry on through that eighth item that we talk about, we end the phrase that the one speaker would end the phrase and speak to everybody that's here that has the, it's his responsibility and duty not to speak the Thanksgiving address after each. So that we kindly and respectfully put our minds together as one and give a great gratitude for what that topic was, whether it's the three sisters or the beans or the fairies, or the medicines and forests and so forth, the winds. We understand the winds can be very powerful and we acknowledge the soft, gentle breezes that travel through and help move about what our mother's responsibilities working with the winds. And the thunder beams that carry the water and they also control the winds and the breezes so that we can be at peace here. And we also always acknowledge that the power that they have and so it goes on further into our elder brother the son and the responsibilities that the son is still continuing on as we see. And our grandmother Moon has the great responsibility of providing the methods and the networking of our next generations to come because she's in control of all waters and currents. That's her responsibility to watch over our mother Earth and all the children here. When you're talking to children, she's also in control of the waters that we all were in and we we're getting ready to come and show our faces to her. Our grandmother Moon has that great responsibility and we kindly and respectfully put our minds together as one and give a great gratitude that she's still carrying on her work as we talk about the peace on earth. And let it be that way in our minds. And we direct our thoughts to the stars. And they also have a great responsibility and they help guide us throughout our ceremonies and our thanksgivings and direct us in certain times of gathering for that event of thanksgiving for a certain. And also the four beings watch over us from the sky and keep our minds clear and straight because sometimes we can think differently by somebody else's actions and sometimes by our own and we're reminded with our great thanksgiving to the four beings to help keep our minds on the right path of goodness and thanksgiving. And then we direct our thoughts to the Creator and then go through it all over again to all of His work and all of the Creator's work and what He has designated others to do, other, other relatives throughout the forest and so forth. And so this is all shared with these people as they come to our house, to our home. And you got to remember, there's translation, there's a language barrier there. So it was actually shown to them as we walk about in the forest, and it took a lot of understanding. So at this time, we're coming into now the, um, the agreements after we notice that these people are going to stay. We've made great friends with a great many of them. But there was also a great many of them had a different set of mind thought to what they were here for. 
and it still goes on today. Our people have went through a lot of suffering. Her people have went through a lot of suffering also. Because the laws of nature are being ignored. The fundamental laws of survival are being ignored. We heard earlier today talk about the water. We talk about hydrofracking and such, if there's any of any way in your mind that you know there's a chance you can spoil the water for the next generations or even the next day's drinking. And it has to be changed to protect that water for generations to come. And so when we talk about hydrofracking, that should be an automatic. It's a no-brainer, they call it. You just don't do it. Because water is so precious. As we all understand, even a teardrop is water. And we all know how precious and sacred a teardrop is, whether it's for happiness or sadness. We understand it that way. And we got to respect that water that way. And so, all this was shared with the Europeans, the newcomers, the people that were seeking out a new life, a new world, they call it the new world. It's old there. I mean, nothing new about it except for the arrival of people looking for freedom. And that's what they found. And so this agreement is called the Turo Wampum. It's known throughout some people's writings and history on the European side as the Daswenta in our language. It's the, the agreement that we have. We documented it in a belt. We'll share that one with you. Alcohol became a big item 
of trade and divide and conquer amongst our people. And it became what we're talking about today, of the, what the drone is doing to people. The same thing happened to us in our lands by somebody else's idea and understanding of how to control where that word control. This agreement doesn't control each other's vessel. We agree to not steer each other's vessels, but yet live side by side, traveling down the river of life together. So we're going to commemorate this with an epic journey from Onondaga, which is over near Syracuse. Syracuse is in our woods. And we're going to travel by water with some allies from the ship paddling alongside of us to Albany and take a break. And then the event, the epic event of the journey itself will begin July 27 from Albany. And we're going to paddle side by side down the Hudson to Manhattan. It's a 13 day journey. There's camping, there's um, certain events land at certain stops and when we arrive in Manhattan we're going to walk across Manhattan where the old path was, if you call it Broadway now. <laughs> <laughs> it actually was the path, the main, the main route and uh, travel over to the United Nations which is August 9th, World Recognition of Indigenous Day and we'll be greeted by some of the um, world leaders that work at the United Nations. And then we're working on uh, this unity of our peoples so that we can survive in peace. And so this message is getting out there. Some of you may have heard of it and so forth, but we have our brothers from the West, the Dakota people of Manitoba, who are going to travel alongside of us in their unity rides. And they're going to travel on horseback. And so we're going to be traveling down side by side um, to deliver a message. We have more of a message. It's not just a message of peace for us, although our peace has been violated so many times. We always look for a healing. Continually looking for a healing, continually giving thanks. And that's why we're still here today. We didn't give in to it. We could have wars going on, we could have battles, we could be attacked, you know. Somebody over here, over there, is giving thanks and carrying on. And so, the decisions that we make today, keep in mind that they're not to negatively affect future generations to come. We invite you all to participate and join us with the epic journey of the 400th anniversary of the Tour of Wampum. Although we know and we hear there's scholars out there that are challenging it, it's easy to understand why, because it violates those people's agendas. The peace violates their agendas. So they want to make it that this didn't happen. We know it happened. And it's going to happen again this year with this paddling side by eights on the river of life. Donate them.